Oi, Roderick, what do you think about aliens? Well, I just reckon, so long as they stay in petty France and bathe themselves, French can do as they like. No, I don't mean the French, Roderick, I mean, you know, dwellers of the moon and such like. Oh, lunatics. Aye, them. Well, God is mighty, and may have placed such folk upon the sun and moon if he so wished. As Metrodorus said, it would be strange if a single ear of corn grew in a large plain. Yea, well, not that strange if the farmer shares your skillet farming, eh? Why, you rascal, I'd like to see your poultry plot yield half as much as mine come this year's harvest. Ooh, ark at him, who be rich Hello, and so welcome to the history of... Oh, don't mind them. They're always arguing about something. Let me get you a drink. Lunatics? Okay, I can see you want an explanation, so let's take a look. The first mention of extraterrestrial life began with a debate amongst the ancient Greeks on the concept of something called cosmic plurality. A pair of ancient Greek philosophers from the Atomist school called Leucippus and Democritus put forward an argument that, as there were an infinite number of atoms, it must follow that there were also an infinite number of worlds. This sounds like a very modern argument, but the Atomists did not have the same concept of atoms, or in fact worlds, that we have today. Their idea of worlds was much more comparable to our concept of parallel universes than our understanding of planetary systems orbiting distant stars. Regardless, one part of their argument was that some of these worlds would have living creatures, plants and water on them. This was one of the earliest allusions to what we in the modern world have come to call extraterrestrial life, and it was emphasised by the 1st century Roman Lucretius, who wrote, Granted then that empty space extends without limit in every direction, and that seeds innumerable are rushing on countless courses through an unfathomable universe, it is in the highest degree unlikely that this earth and sky is the only one to have been created, and that all those particles are accomplishing nothing. This follows from the fact that our world has been made by the spontaneous and casual collision and the multifarious accidental, random and purposeless congregation and coalescence of atoms, whose suddenly formed combinations could serve to produce earth and sea and sky and the races of living creatures. But of course, not all philosophers agreed with the atomists. Most importantly, Plato and Aristotle disagreed. In Plato's Timaeus, he asserted that to the end that this world may be like the complete and living creature in respect of its uniqueness, for that reason its maker did not make two worlds, nor yet an indefinite number, but the heaven has come to be, and is and shall be hereafter, one and unique. Aristotle expanded on Plato's rejection of the idea of cosmic plurality, repeatedly rejecting it in multiple works. In his On the Heavens, Aristotle claimed that earthly and watery substances move downwards towards their natural place at the centre of the earth, whilst fire and air move upwards towards their natural place. This was Aristotle's doctrine of natural place, and he believed that for another world to exist, it would have to contradict this doctrine, and thus there must be no other worlds. There were other philosophers with different ideas on the topic. Anaxagoras imagined lunar cities inhabited by lunar beings, and Heraclides of Pontus thought that the moon was an earth enveloped in mist. But it was the Pythagoreans who had possibly the most fleshed out concept of moon dwellers, as the first century philosopher Aetius tells us. Among the Pythagoreans, there are those, including Philolaus, who attribute the moon's earth-like appearance to the fact that it is inhabited all over, just like our earth, by creatures and plants that are larger and more beautiful, for creatures on the moon are 15 times greater in strength and do not produce any excrement, and the lunar day is 15 times longer than the terrestrial day. The important thing to remember here, though, is that whilst the atomists were big on cosmic pluralism, Plato and Aristotle rejected it completely, and when the early Christians came along, they did too. This included Hippolytus in the 3rd century, who, on discussing Democritus's belief in infinite worlds, says simply that, This philosopher turned all things into ridicule, as if all the concerns of humanity were deserving of laughter. And then there was Theodoret in the 5th century, who said, those who refuse to accept the existence of the second heaven stray from the right path, while those who venture to enumerate more follow mythological fables and spurn the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And this is how things stayed for the first thousand years of Christianity. But then, Aristotle's works arrived in Europe, having been translated into Latin in the 12th century. This included his Decalo, which was made available in 1170, and had two chapters devoted to the rejection of cosmic plurality. So, for a century nothing changed, as Aristotle's rejection of the concept of other worlds went unchallenged by scholars, and many scholars of the early 13th century didn't even bother citing Aristotle's arguments, rejecting the concept of other planets simply because of their rejection of the possibility of the void, which would be required to exist between theoretical other worlds. One of these scholars was Roger Bacon, who wrote, If there were another universe, it would be of spherical figure, like this one, 
and there cannot be distance between them, because in that case there would be a vacant space without a body between them, which is false. Therefore they must touch, but they cannot touch each other except in one point by the twelfth proposition of the third book of the elements, as has already been shown by circles. Hence elsewhere than in that point there will be vacant space between them. Thomas Aquinas was perhaps the first to break from Aristotle's arguments on cosmic plurality, although in a very minor way. He accepted Aristotle's conclusions and his arguments about the various elements having their natural place, but he made one adjustment. Aristotle had not addressed the problem of the acceleration of falling bodies. If all elements simply move towards their natural place, why do they speed up as they do so? Aquinas addressed this problem, arguing for a variation of the intensity of an element with its distance from its natural place. It was a small adjustment, but it opened the floodgates for further deviations from Aristotle. Although medieval scholars had largely swallowed Aristotle's arguments, the church had not, and in 1277 the Bishop of Paris, Etienne Tempier, condemned 219 beliefs commonly held in the universities which he considered heretical because they infringed on the power of God. One of these was the belief that God could not make a plurality of worlds. This threat of being accused of heresy scared many university masters into taking a harder look at Aristotle. For the last quarter of the 13th century, the worm turned, and Aristotelian ideas about the plurality of worlds met with fierce criticism from scholars of the universities of Oxford and Paris, medieval Europe's centres of intellectual pursuits. These scholars held that God could create other worlds, and that those worlds could determine their own motions. However, the theological reasoning behind these criticisms was made clear by John Buridan, who summed up the general opinion in his 14th century work on Aristotle's Decalo. It must be realised that while another world than this is not possible naturally, this is possible simply speaking, since we hold from faith that just as God made this world, so he could make another or several worlds. This argument can essentially be ground down to, don't worry, a wizard did it. This was improved upon by William of Ockham, who argued that if there were two worlds, then Earth on our world would move to the centre of our world, but Earth on the other world would move to the centre not of our world, but of its own world. Thanks, surprisingly, to a threat of heresy accusations, scholars had begun to significantly move away from Aristotle's theory of natural place. So, now we have a plurality of worlds being acknowledged by the 13th century. What about aliens? Here enters the 15th century cardinal Nicholas of Cusa, who wrote, Life as it exists here on Earth, in the form of men, animals and plants, is to be found, let us suppose, in a higher form in the solar and stellar regions. Rather than think that so many stars and parts of the heavens are uninhabited, and that this Earth of ours alone is peopled, and that with beings perhaps of an inferior type, we will suppose that in every region there are inhabitants, differing in nature by rank and allowing their origin to God, who is the centre and circumference of all stellar regions. It may be conjectured that in the area of the sun there exist solar beings, bright and enlightened intellectual denizens, and by nature more spiritual than such as may inhabit the moon, who are possibly lunatics, whilst those on earth are more gross and material. It may be supposed that those solar intelligences are highly actualised and little in potency, while the earth denizens are much in potency and little in act, and the moon dwellers betwixt and between. And Cusa was not the only one to raise the question of alien life in the 15th century. William of Varlong also did so, stating that such creatures would not exist in sin and did not spring from Adam, but it is shown that they would exist from the virtue of God, transported to that world as Enoch and Elias in the earthly paradise. As to the question of whether Christ by dying on this earth could redeem the inhabitants of another world, I answer that he is able to do this, even if the worlds are infinite but it would not be fitting for him to go into another world that he must die again. And that is where the medieval period, brought to its end in 1485 and replaced by the early modern era, leaves us. The following centuries would see more focus on alien life. When Galileo sent his Sidereus Nuncius, which reported the first telescopic observations of the Moon, the stars, the Milky Way and four of the satellites of Jupiter to Kepler in 1610, Kepler asked questions which were being asked until relatively recently. Was the circular cavity on the Moon the work of lunar inhabitants? Were the moons of Jupiter for the benefit of Jovians? Did the Moon have an atmosphere which moderated the heat the Moon dwellers received? Even some of the most recent books published in defence of beings living on the surface of the Sun were relatively recent, written by Carl Goetze in 1896 and Sir Edwin Arnold in 1894. However, the invention of spectroscopy in 1858 allowed astronomers to determine the chemical composition and temperatures of various heavenly bodies, bringing the beginning of the end to claims of alien life within this solar system, 
apart from on Mars, where sightings of canals have been reported in 1877. But we're now way outside our scope. If you want to know more, I've left a list of sources for you to check out down below. And don't forget to subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. A big shout out to my patrons who help me keep producing content, and if you want to join them on our Patreon Discord server, help support the channel and see videos earlier, you can check out my Patreon link in the description below. I'll see you next time.